Well, well thank you. Um, Danny, thank, thanks so much for being with us and taking the time to be here. Um, this is one of those, uh, he needs no introduction and anything I would tell you about his credentials would almost sound silly at this point, particularly to this audience. Um, so I'll just more personally um, highlight that in, in, in addition to his amazing work that's influenced everyone in this room um, in a variety of remarkable ways, um, I've had the good opportunity to work with Danny in a variety of applied contexts, and he's this enormously creative and insightful and unique context where he doesn't spend five years working on a paper, um, but responds sort of on a moment's notice. Um, and he also has an enormous interest in exactly what this conference is about, creating enduring social change um, for the good. So it's, it's um, terrific to, to have you with us. Um, um, by the way, I'm nervous. I, I, like <laughs> last night, I, some of you saw me at the Trucadero. I wasn't nervous at all there. I'm really nervous here. Uh, somehow, interviewing Danny makes me nervous. Um, um, and I, but I, no, you're making me nervous. But, <laughs> but I, 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 and I actually did a lot of preparation. So I, I watched uh, Craig Fox's wonderful interview of you, um, and Leif Nelson's wonderful interview of you, um, and um, I was inspired by watching. And I, I stole absolutely nothing from them. Um, in part because I think that the, the, the folks in this room have read fast, uh, um, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, have read The Undoing Project, and a lot of the history we, has been covered. So my plan is to focus much more on the theme that we've been working on for the last day and a half, and that is stickiness. Um, the stickiness of ideas and the stickiness of changing behavior. Um, so, so that's kind of the plan. I'm going to ask about a half a dozen questions um, and then turn it over to the audience um, for follow-up. Um, and, and among the things that are stickiest out there in our world um, are a couple of papers you wrote, 174 and 179. They've been cited more than a few times. Um, why were those, why have those two papers been so enormously sticky um, in our world? Um, I think I understand why the first paper, the 74 paper, uh, was sticky. And, and of course, like you know, most everything else, it's a bit of luck. Uh, I was, uh, I'll have to tell you a bit of history, uh, my personal history. In 1964, Walter Michel published a paper on his dissertation. And, and it had a story that I found enchanting. Uh, he had interviewed children in Jamaica and, uh, and asked them two questions. One of them, you can have a small lollipop now or that bigger lollipop tomorrow. That was one question. And the other one was that there is a fairy who can make of you whatever you want to be. What do you want to be? Scored one if a profession or an occupation was mentioned or something related to achievement, scored zero otherwise. So there were two questions, dichotomous. They predicted everything in sight. I mean, the, you know, in terms of the variables that correlated with them. And I was just, I fell in love with the idea of doing what I call the psychology of single questions. And at the time, you know, most of the time you had tests and you, pre you many items and you, you devised, I mean, we still do, but, but here was Michel, he was taking a concept, a very rich concept, and he was boiling it down to its essence to just one thing. So I really wanted to do the psychology of, uh, of single questions, and I tried to do it in a very unimaginative way, uh, uh, mimicking Michel and so on. And then Amos Tosi and I uh, started collaborating. That was just a few years later. And, uh, and that was the opportunity. And what we did with the psychology of single questions, that is, every question that we asked was making a point, and it was supposed to be self-contained. I mean, you saw that question, and you were supposed to infer the point. So that was one part of it. The other part of it was um, 
that I had been a student of perception. And I had studied the text of Gestalt psychologists. And every one of you, I mean, all of you have taken an, under, an undergraduate course, an introductory course, and you've seen figure ground effects. You know, they're on a page, they're illustrated. You are your own subject when you look at that material. And combining those two, meant that we wrote articles, and we did that in all our articles, including prospect theory. We wrote all our articles with the questions posed to the subjects as, as part of the text as illustrations, turning the reader into a subject, just the way that the Gestalt psychologists have done. Now, you know, this is really not deep. This is completely, this is a choice of medium. But it's the choice of medium that made the difference. Because people, especially outside the discipline, respond completely differently to an experience that they have and to a description of some failures of undergraduates, of some stupid thing that some undergraduates have done. So when you feel tempted to make a mistake or when you actually find yourself making that mistake, it's a completely different thing. So. That particular format had a very big impact. It was because it, we, it appeared in science. People in all sorts of disciplines read it. The single questions, it turned out, are memorable. And, and you, you can ask your spouse. You can ask your friends. I mean, you know, some of them are funny. Many of them are funny because the work that we're doing was funny. I mean, there was an irony in, uh, in the work itself, since we were always picking at our own mistakes. Uh, that was the fun. That's, that, I think, is the key to the success of that first paper. I mean, it had b many good had ideas. Had some good ideas, too. It had yeah. many good ideas, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but actually, the medium is what made the difference. So that so it's uh, th that intrigues me because you and I have talked about teaching a fair amount, and I tend to teach Kahneman and Tversky 101 by having the students fall victim to the mistakes, and and at some point you developed the notion that that was too harsh, that it was better to teach people about the mistakes that other people made in order to get that accepted. Uh, why the change from the way you wrote those papers to the your preferred style of teaching? No, I mean, I, I actually, uh, I don't think you're quoting me correctly because okay. I don't recognize myself in that. I do teach, I mean, you know, I, I, I do teach in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't, the point that I have been making is that don't try to introspect too much. You know, don't try to question yourself. It's much more fun to look for the mistakes that other people make. I mean, that's a different point. <laughs> but, uh, not, uh, I'll take, I'll take yeah. that as a correction. So uh, we've been talking briefly about your ideas sticking, um, but what most of the folks in this room have been talking about is how to get um, behavioral change that occurs to actually stick and last over time. Um, so this, that's been the main theme of, the, of, the, of, of this meeting. Give us wisdom on this topic. Of what does it take to make? I won't give you wisdom, but I'll, I'll give you, I'll cite the idea that for me it's the best idea I ever heard in psychology. And I heard it as an undergraduate. And it was the first thing I taught when I taught psychology in the policy school. Woodrow Wilson, I started with that story. And it's the story of how you induce people to change their behavior, as taught by Kurt Lewin, Levine, Lewin, whatever your favorite pronunciation is. Now, he is my <coughs> intellectual grandfather. I was taught as an undergraduate at Hebrew University. I was taught by somebody who was Lewin's student. And he sort of would, you know, he would shake whenever he mentioned it. Lewin was evidently a very special person who got everybody imprinted that was uh, his student. And 
And Lewin had a field theory of behavior, which is a very interesting notion. But the notion is that the individual is moving in a, in a space, a space of behavior, and, and the individual is like a point, and all of causation is external. So there are things that push you in a certain direction, and there are obstacles. And there are uh, driving forces that drive you in a particular direction, and there are restraining forces which are preventing you from going there. And, and the notion that Lewin offers is that behavior is an equilibrium between the driving and, and the restraining forces. And you can see that, you know, the speed at which you drive, for example, is an equilibrium. When you are rushing someplace, you feel tired or you're worried about police. You don't, there is an equilibrium speed. The, the, the complexity of how you talk, depending on who you're talking with, there is an equilibrium. I mean, a lot of things can be described as an equilibrium between driving and restraining forces. And Lewin's insight was that if you want to achieve change in behavior, there is one good way to do it and one bad way to do it. And the good way to do it is by uh, diminishing the restraining forces, not by increasing the driving forces. And that, that turns out to be profoundly non-intuitive. The, the primary intuition that we have when we want somebody to do something is to push them to do it. And we push by arguments. Arguments are driving forces. We push by incentives. We push, we push by threats. Diminishing the restraining forces is a completely different kind of activity because it starts <coughs> with a different question. It starts instead of asking, how can I get him or her to do it? Uh, it starts with the question of, why isn't she doing it already? very different question. Why not? <coughs> and when you list the why not, which is, you know, what the, the Lewinian idea implies, when you list the why not, you find things that the person may be ashamed of, may not be telling you, you find incentives that are not legitimate, you find all sorts of reasons of why not. And then you go one by one systematically. I mean, I'm putting words in Lewin's mouth, but, but, that's, the, but that's the gist. You, you go down that list systematically and you ask, what can I do to make it easier for that person to move? And it turns out that the way to make things easier is by is almost always by controlling the individual's environment, broadly speaking, by just making it easier. If there are incentives that work against it, let's change the incentives. If there, are, uh, if there is social pressure or if there is somebody who is against it, I want to influence B, but there is A in the background and it's actually A who is a restraining force on B. Let's work on A, not on B. And I want to share with you the motivation or the, you know, what, what to me was uh, the way. Now, did I read this or did I actually? I can't tell you whether it was in the original or whether I invented it. But, but imagine, imagine a board that, that is held by two sets of springs. So there are springs pushing the board this way, there are springs pushing the, the board this way. Now you want to make the board move in this direction. There are two ways you can do it. You can add a spring that pushes it, or you can 
remove a spring that restrains it. That's the restraining force. What Lewin was saying was there is an interesting difference between the two. And the difference is in the strain on the board, the stress on the board. That in one case, by increasing the driving force, you, are, you have gotten to that place, but the conflict has gotten worse. When you reduce the restraining force, you get to the same place, but there is less conflict, there is less tension than there was earlier. I have never heard a psychological idea that impressed me quite as much at this moment, perhaps because you know I was at an impressionable age. But, but later, what impressed me is how non-intuitive that is. So, uh, like a very long time ago, about half a century ago, I, we were teaching, a colleague of mine and friend, we were teaching in Israel courses on behavior change. And those courses, the, the context that I remember best was people would come in, that was the period of mass immigration into Israel from all sorts of places, so people who had never been farmers were being taken to a village and being told, now you're farmers, and they'd be farmers. And they had no idea what to do. And they were leaders, and we were training leaders to do that. So part of what we, uh, part of what we were talking about was how to, how to cause people to change their behavior in one way or another. And we had an exercise. We constructed an exercise that would take about 48 hours, which involved role playing. And there was a case, and there were, and there were roles, and we role played, and and they, the people there, had an opportunity to interview my colleague and, and me, to collect more information about the case, because you know there was stuff they had they had read, but it wasn't complete, so they could, you know, so I would act, I don't know, the rabbi of the community, and and uh, somebody from. Our students, uh, the participants in the course, would interview me, presumably in order to find something out. That wasn't what they did. <laughs> when they would start to me, they would start convincing me of the change that they wanted to induce. They were not asking questions, they were telling me things. Turns out, that is the intuitive way to proceed when you want to induce change. You talk to people, you make them do things, you increase the incentives, you argue with them. So, you ask for wisdom, Kurt Lewin's wisdom, roughly eight years old. Still good. It's still the best. I mean, you know, there is a book, um, Lee Ross and Dick Nesbitt wrote a book on the person and the situation, which is the one book that I have seen in recent decades that, that captures some of the magic, I would say only some of the magic of what Kurt Lewin had to say uh, in, in the 1940s and 1950s. Long answers, but Terrific answer. sorry about that. So, uh, so I want to do a little bit of history. So, um, and I'll give a very short history, and then you can correct it and, and then comment on it. So, um, I, I realize that most of the people in this room don't remember the 1970s um, when. At least not clearly. <laughs> at least not clearly. <laughs> I think actually yeah. I don't remember it at all. Um, but there was a time when, after your 74 paper, where psychologists became acutely aware of your work. I think economists weren't paying too much attention. Prospect theory gets developed, and that just made economists sort of mad for a while. And then eventually, the behavioral economics movement starts. But throughout the, the last millennium, this was kind of more of an academic literature. And in this millennium, we've seen this robust movement 
into the real world by groups that do research like the members here, by the behavioral insight teams. And there are also a bunch of events that happen. You won the Nobel Prize in the early part of the millennium. Uh, Nudge came out, Thinking Fast and Slow came out. We now have the Undoing Project. So a lot of critical events. How do you sort of explain the shift from academic to intense real world interests? And what do you see as a critical events in that history? Well, I can tell you something about the personal history of behavior economics because I was there. Um, so behavior economics, as, as it currently exists, I think started in a bar. And it started in a conversation between Amos and me and a person, Eric Warner, who at the time was vice president of the Sloan Foundation. And eventually, they, soon thereafter, became the president of the Russell Sage Foundation, from which he retired a few years ago. And Eric approached Amos and me at the bar and said that uh, he wanted to bring psychology and economics closer together. And he wanted our advice as to how he should go about it. And, um, and I remember two things I told him. Uh, I remember telling him, this is not a project on which you can spend a lot of money honestly. You can waste a lot of money, but it's not. And, and you shouldn't spend any money on psychologists who want to influence economics. You should look for economists who might be interested in what psychology has to say. Now, there was such an economist, and his name was Richard Thaler. Richard had, by accident, I don't know if how many of you have read his book, Misbehaving, but those of you who haven't should. It's a lovely book. Richard had met a student of Amos and mine, Bob Fischoff, who many of you know at least by name, had met him at a conference, and he heard about our work and about prospect theory. Now, Richard was a student in economics. He hates my saying the next two things I'll say about him. Three things. I mean, one of them I think he would tolerate. I think he's a genius. That's that one he accepts. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think he's lazy, which is very important because that means everything he works on is important. I thought he took pride in that. No. Uh, actually, I mean, he takes, uh, it's sort of mixed, uh, his feelings about that. But I, um, I've made him famous for being lazy, actually. Uh, and, and the third one is not really very good at math. So when you have a genius who is not very good at math in an economics department, interesting <laughs> things happen. Uh, among them, that he looks ironically at, at what's going on, at the stupid things his teachers are thinking. Uh, and, and so he sort of fell in love with the work that Amos and I were doing. And now this links with Eric Warner because the very first grant that Eric Warner gave, I think, when he became president of the Russell Sage Foundation was for Dick Thaler to spend a year with me in Vancouver. I was at the University of British Columbia at the time. And, and I think the real beginning of behavior economics is a paper that, that Dick published in 1980 on the positive psychology of the consumer. Uh, I think it's just a, a, a wonderful thing. And Dick himself is a pretty wonderful guy uh, with a marvelous sense of humor. And it turns out that Dick's marvelous sense of humor is very important in the history of this field. And what made it very important was Another well-known economist, Joe Stiglitz, who was, for many years, the editor of the Journal of Economic Perspectives. Now, the Journal of Economic Perspectives is a bit like the American Psychologist. I mean, it's a journal that everybody who is a member of the 
American Economic Association gets as part of their subscription to, to them. And Joe had the idea of asking Dick Thaler to write a column in every issue. And Dick offered the name Anomalies. And in those columns called Anomalies, Dick in every issue found uh, a co-author, an expert in a field, and something sort of ridiculous from the point of view of, of economic theory that was nevertheless a fact. That was true, and there were many anomalies to, uh, in, to economic theory, to standard economic theory. And, and Dick published anomalies once every few months, I don't know the frequency of the GEP, uh, for years. And every economist got to read them, and they were all funny. They were all brilliant, and they were all funny and important. And they cast doubt on sort of the basic rational agent model systematically, without preaching just the facts that had a huge impact. So when you ask, you know, how did behavior economics happen? It's an accident, you know, like all accidents. So there was that meeting in a bar, and then there was that year in Vancouver, and then there was Joe Stiglitz having an idea about anomalies. And what about the kink into the real world? Mm -hmm. That is Dick Thaler. The nudge is entirely Dick. I mean, you know, I get credit. That's ridiculous. In the the whole idea, uh, you know, a lot of the nudges have to do with incentives and self-control. And we were not into self-control, Mr. Tversky and I. This is entirely Dick Thaler's focus. He was interested in that. It was, it was there from his early work. It was there from the 1980s. He had problems with uh, peanuts and, uh, you know, how people lose self-control. And interestingly enough, uh, how how changing the situation solved the self-control problem, like, like taking those peanuts and bring, taking them to the kitchen, which is one of his examples. I thought they were cashews. Cashews, yeah, that's okay. right. And, and <laughs> while, while nibbling on some on the way, which is a typical Dick Thaler sort of food. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask one more question, and then we're going to open up to the audience. Um, so, uh, uh, and I'm sort of returning to a Lewin theme. You talked about eliminating barriers. <coughs> Can you tell us what you see as a cur uh, currently the key psychological barriers that have to be overcome for us to effectively implement the wise ideas that this room has been generating over the last day and a half? So if you can imagine that this group is generating very wise ideas um, on education, on health, on financial savings, but it certainly isn't easy to get implementation. What, what psych psychology do we have to understand about people that we have to overcome to get there? I think, I think this is something that you and I probably know well in part from, uh, even from our joint experiences. And this is what happens in large organizations. Uh, and what happens in large organizations, uh, it's, it's, rem it's just remarkable how difficult it is to make anything happen. And it's, it's difficult to make anything happen even when the CEO is on your side. You know, the CEO wants it to happen. Nothing happens. Uh, the, the, the inertia in large organizations, the, the, the infinite ability to do nothing uh, in large organizations, you know, that's, that's really, now, I think the idea, the basic idea that you have here, that money is no object and let's do large scale experiments, uh, that is wonderful, well, that's just great. But the, the obstacle that you hit is how do you get your ideas into those large systems, even when you know you have convinced the the CEO and the board and, and the top <laughs> executives? How do you get that actually implemented? 
and that can get really difficult. I would I would think that this is going to be an obstacle, and and here typically, my guess is you will encounter you will encounter some conflict uh, because you have to give you have to in some way give control give some of the control become become partners with the people with whom you work in the organization you cannot come with ready made ideas and hope for them to be implemented it's not going to happen that way i think thank you um, so I'm going to open it up to the audience, and I ask that you start by introducing yourself and uh, do your best to ask a question that ends with a question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Floor is open. And really, it is open. Anybody is here? Ke Kevin Volk, University of Pennsylvania. One of the observations we've had is that there, there are some behaviors that seem much easier to change and have longer term effects than others. I think a lot of this does have to do with the environment in which people are living. So for example, if you can get people to quit smoking and stay smoke-free for a year, most of them thereafter will stay smoke-free. You know, if I wanted to smoke during this break, I'd have to walk 15 minutes, leave this building. It's obviously very costly. But in contrast, it's very hard to help people lose weight and keep it off. And I think the fundamental challenge is that there are a lot of aspects to the environment that neither the people we're trying to affect or whose behavior we're trying to change or we can fully control. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how we might think about those kinds of problems where there's really a limit to how much we can influence the environment in which that person's choices are, are being made. Well, uh, you know, if I if I knew the answer to the to your question, uh, you know, lots of people would know the answer to your question. It's that's the big question. And, but you're uh, an economist. Uh, and <laughs> uh, I, whether there is, you know, where I've stayed sort of true to the Lavinian ideas from an undergraduate is really not to trust willpower and not to ask anything too much of willpower. Uh, and, and lots of people around this room you know, have had ideas about how you, can, how you can get people to change their behavior without trusting their willpower. I mean, that's the first thing. Let's, uh, the, the general principle is the Lewinian principle of making things easy. And, and some of the, and I think that dieting, for example, is really a matter of uh, restructuring your environment. In the one time in my life when, you know, I was told I'm a diabetic and I, it's really important for me to lose weight. Uh, I mean, the, the, the kitchen looked different. There were many things that were just not there that I had been used to. Uh, so again, it's changing the environment. But, you know, it's the only song I know. I mean, I'm sure there are, there are other things. Um, like, you know, how do you make people, how do you create habits, self-reinforcing habits that I know nothing about? The environment would be my song. Hi, Danny. David Yeager, uh, UT Austin. Um, so I want to take seriously for a second the idea that people find uh, Lewinian um, removing restraining forces uh, studies counterintuitive. And what that means, if this group is successful, let's imagine we, we develop strong Lewinian-informed interventions, and then there's a real barrier to uptake in policy and practice because the approach is so counterintuitive. Um, is there another, is there a heuristic people apply when thinking about behavior change? Is there the kind of, you know, do they apply a kind of representativeness heuristic to change behavior by changing the person, making them want it more? And in doing so, do they underuse or discredit um, certain approaches? And just a concrete example, in the Obama first campaign, right, 
a, a, a viral thing to do was to make fun of the campaign for saying people should fill up their tires, right? There's all kinds of models where people with, you know, the cars would be more efficient if they, the tires were fully inflated. Um, but that seemed um, uh, ridiculous to people in some way. So I guess I'm wondering what, what you think about as the science moves into policy and practice, are we going to run into heuristic thinking and, and the more counterintuitive, maybe the less uptake there might be? You know, I'm, I'm actually I'm not sure. Um, count, it's counterintuitive in the sense that it really is not going to be the first thing that comes to people's minds when, when you talk about it. On the other hand, I have always found that it's an immediately understandable idea when you try to explain it. Why, why restraining forces? <coughs> why the environment? How, you know, how it would make it, it easier? So I. I think that it should be possible to train people <coughs> to think along those lines, because that's a th sort of thought exercise to which, you know, I, there, are, there are not major restraining forces to adopting that frame of mind uh, about change. Why it hasn't happened, you know, why, why by and large, this is not as obvious as many other things that have come to psychology. It's really something I, I don't have an answer to that. I don't understand. Intuitively, and, and here you may be right, because intuitively we tend, we tend to commit the fundamental attribution error, which is the opposite of this, which is that causation is always internal and not from the environment and then you want to change the person rather than changing the environment. So that's, that's the intuition. Uh, but there has not been a major effort to teach people this is fundamentally wrong and, and ask the why not question before you do anything else. About? About research. Doing research. Yeah. And, and, and then I heard you over the years talking about what, uh, what psychologists could bring to the table. And I, I'm just, you know, this is a meeting of psychologists and economists. And in a way, what, what do we psychologists can bring to the, to the table of behavioral intervention? What, what is the thing that we can teach a field that has been doing that for so many? So you're asking for what is sort of what is uniquely psychological, or yeah. what uh, what do psychologists bring to the table? Now I should add, Dick is Dick Thaler is a poor example of all this because he really is a psychologist at heart, and he thinks like a psychologist. So it's not uh, uh, it, it wasn't a matter of educating him in thinking differently, but in general, I think there is a fair number of things that that we think, in, in part because economists are very powerfully trained in the power of incentives to the extent that uh, very little else uh, comes to mind. And, and psychologists tend to be quite skeptical about, about incentives and much more concerned with things, with softer things like self-image and uh, so, and, and you know, interpersonal ties and imitation of other people and modeling, you know. And so we have, we have a whole range of ideas about what moves behavior, which are not incentives. And it's the combination of these, <coughs> it's viewing the fact that incentives <coughs> are very important, uh, 
with that whole set of other things that do influence behavior a lot. So I think there is really room for very productive exchange. Stephen? Can I go back to um, Lewin and restraining versus driving? So this is kind of a much more primordial question than David asked. But where do you think, um, is it just part of human instinct, the uh, assumption that driving works better than restraining? Like, are we all, is it a little dictator complex that we all have, not only about ourselves, but others? Well, you know, I mean, it, it seems to me that it's a natural thing to do. That is, when you want to move an object, you move it. And when you want somebody to, when you want to move somebody, you try to move them. And uh, and you know how you're going to move them? Well, you know you, uh, you can do it physically, or, or you can do it with words. But but the idea the idea of uh, looking at the situation from that individual's point of view, which is the only way that you can find restraining forces, that is really not very natural. So. Uh, you know, it's, it is primordial. It is, you know, very basic that when we want to do something, we, when we want things to move, we move them. It's about the, that much, I think. Katie? Um, one of the things I was thinking about is, is the risk of over-promising. And I, I don't know if you've been part of these conversations specifically, but I feel like every few years I hear people worrying about have we over promised what psychology can contribute to policy and uh, you know are people expecting too much from things like the the nudge unit relative to what they can deliver um, so I, I, I suspect it even if you haven't been part of those conversations you've thought about it and I'm curious as we embark on this sort of massive adventure with the hope of changing behavior for good and making permanent as opposed to sort of temporary changes so not just changing a default but trying to figure out how do we create uh, change that's sustained even after we leave the picture. Um, we, you know, we may overpromise. we may not achieve as much as fast as we want to. In fact, I guarantee those things will be true. Um, and how you think about those risks and, and sort of managing uh, expectations while doing this in a very public way. And I, th I think a lot of what you've done in the last decade has been very public. So you may have well, some insights. There, there is a real problem in you know, social problem that uh, if you realistically present to people what can be achieved in solving a problem, they will find that completely uninteresting. Mm -hmm. You have to <laughs> overpromise in order to get anything done. I mean, that's that you know that really is part of it, because you take you know you take a problem like poverty or, or and well. President Johnson was about to solve the problem. Civil rights, you know, he was just about to solve the problem. And if at the realistic objective, you know, which is to reduce this by 12% and to increase that by five and, and so on, uh, people would have said that's trivial. We want to solve the problem. And so overpromising is part of the game. I think you know you, you you can't you can't get anywhere without some degree of overpromising. The complaints that have been made, you know, by George Lowenstein and others about about nudges, I think, are really unfair. Because uh, nudging has not caused anybody to stop doing politics. The possibility of nudging. So obviously, you know, if you can move the political system. Uh, that's what people will do. Uh, nudging is a way of getting small effect by minuscule at minuscule cost. You know, that's that's what it is. That and no more. And what you are doing is another way of doing it. And maybe you can move the needle from small effect to a little bigger effect. You know? And and you have to overpromise in order to do that. I agree with you. I sent George a note when his New York Times op-ed came out saying this is a mistake. It's unfair. So, so I agree that over-promising 
sorry, David Lateson. Uh, I, I know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I agree that overpromising has the virtue that it accelerates the initial effort, but it has the cost that it undermines the ongoing effort. So I'm surprised, particularly in light of all the work you've done explaining the psychological biases, like the planning fallacy and other biases that lead us to overpromise, not because we're doing it as a rational, sophisticated strategy, but rather as a psychological error. I'm surprised to hear you saying today that overpromising is a wise strategy. I would have I, thought. I never used the word wise strategy. Uh, you said it was necessary. I was saying it's very unlikely to happen otherwise. I mean, you know, it's not the that when you look at, and this is typical and, and quite general, that is when you look at big successes, the people who carried out those big successes were unreasonably optimistic, typically. So that there is a dose of self over, you know, promising too much to yourself, which prospectively is a bad idea. Retrospectively, whenever you look at the big successes, you are going to find it. So it's a necessary condition for big success. Uh, and, and I think the same is true with respect to, to change. That when to achieve a 10% improvement you know, in, in this or that measure of discrimination, uh, you have to, you can't promise 10% because people will find it trivial. But are you recommending that we overpromise, or are you saying it just happens I, to be I'm a just, coincidence? I'm just saying you are probably going to overpromise, you know, for all, for a lot of good reasons. Right. But I agree. And, uh, and I wouldn't fight you on this. You know, that's not the worst thing that can happen, I think. Uh, because it may be necessary to get the resources. And it may be necessary to get the initial enthusiasm that is needed to do anything at all. Because there's so much inertia that realistic promises are at a major disadvantage. When, and they're at a major disadvantage because everybody else is over-promising. What about the benefit of having a reputation for consistently delivering what you promise, a reputation you build well, up over many that, decades, which is that very would be, If you can build such a reputation and actually accomplish things without over-promising, that would be wonderful. I would never argue against that. I think it's much better. I was, uh, I was expressing some skepticism. That is that if, you know, you have a crowd of people starting, all with good intentions, all with similar talents, and some of them, you know, really do never overpromise as a matter of principle, and others do overpromise. And you look ten years later, and you ask who accomplished more. It may very well be that the overpromises will accomplish more, although I approve of the realistic ones. And Please, right? Uh, Roy Rosen from uh, from Pan. So you've seen a lot of technology change in your life, right? You know, so um, when you started, there weren't text messaging and cell phones, let alone Instagram and Snapchat. There weren't, you know, websites, and there weren't, you know, even personal computers. And I'm, I'm curious <coughs> what you've learned, both the upside and the pitfalls of adopting new technology in interventions. As I wonder if, when you do your work, how the technology changes get incorporated into experiments or into work that you do, or how you've seen that influence or, or be a problem in what people do with their work? Sure. I mean, you know, technology is completely, uh, it's changed every superficial aspect of what we do in our work. Mm -hmm. uh, whether, I have often asked myself whether all these wonderful things that are now at my disposal, uh, whether people are genuinely more productive than they were like 50 years ago, mm -hmm. you know, by and large. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not sure. You know, I wrote I wrote my first book uh, written to, uh, I wrote one in 1973, and I wrote it with a pencil, and I've got the deformation in my finger from that pencil, you know, 45 years later. Uh, and, and it was completely different because I couldn't write many drafts mm. because my secretary would have shot me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was, now I can, I can write so many drafts mm. and it's quite costly. That, that, so I was writing completely differently and as an example, I'm, I'm not at all sure. Mm. You know, it was much more important to outline so I made myself outline. I mean, there were lots of things that mm that where the technology has, is actually a way of wasting time. Mm. And so there are, you know, there are pros and cons, mm -hmm. but, uh, but on the whole, I would say it's, it's, it's less profound than you would think it would be. Mm -hmm. Now, Google and Google Scholar have completely changed mm -hmm. uh, the, way, uh, the way I work and I suppose the way that other people work. And and it's a trade. It's, it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off between finding things very easily and storing them. You know, I just had so much more memorized, and not only telephone numbers, but I, I would read an article and I would know that it would be very difficult to find it again. You know, it was important to not only to get what I need from that article right this minute, because I can find it again if I need it. All these things, uh, they all have trade-offs, I think. I wouldn't give any of them up, <laughs> but, uh, but they all have trade-offs. Please. Um, I'm Lynette, and I'm a research coordinator here at Penn. Um, from a research perspective, what kind of things do you think are important for people to Well, uh, shame is actually an interesting example because uh, shame, to a large extent, is environmental. That is, you know, it's an internal emotion, but it's controlled by the outside. And so you can reduce shaming. I mean, you know, if, if shame is a problem, then you, want to, then you want to influence it from the outside. That would be a very natural application. People are ashamed of doing that. Why are they ashamed of doing that? Who is shaming them? How can we cause those people who are shaming them to act differently? And the, the, so the, the, main, the main benefit you know, from the Lewinian idea is that the point of application, where, what you're going to do very frequently is indirect. So you want to influence this person, but it's that person you have to talk to. You, uh, you want to influence this person, but actually what you've got to worry about is what job will be offered to them once this change occurs. And then you've got to, to deal with the people who offer that job. So there is, that's the main, uh, that's the main lesson that I, I took from the Lewinian idea. Angela? Do you think that if you read Thinking Fast and Slow, you become a better decision maker? And more generally, does, does, does the hope of taking the insights that led to nudges, right, but then giving them to the actual actors themselves so that they can autonomously change their kitchen to be more diabetic friendly or make studying easier, do you actually have the intuition that a user's guide to the human mind will help humans? Uh, really? I mean, to, uh, I'm, I'm not a, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm known as a pessimist, so uh, I'm not an optimist about anything, but I'm not really an optimist about self, about self-change. I'm, uh, I'm much more of an optimist about organizations, because organizations can change procedures, they can change environments, and they can do things. I think it is possible, you know, for a minority of people to to learn the importance of what's in their kitchen. 
yes, they want to control their eating, uh, to learn where to place things, because it turns out that every 10 centimeters you know, has, has an effect on the likelihood that you'll snap. So people can learn these things, but, but I think they're not very deep. Just picking up, uh, your book also enthusiastically endorsed the System 1, System 2 distinction. Is moving from System 1 to System 2 a strategy for becoming more sophisticated and avoiding these mistakes? Well, uh, you know, System 1 and System 2 are metaphors, but the, uh, the, the question is, when do you want to slow down? And that's basically the issue, is when do I want to slow down and think about it? And when do I want to slow down and get advice? But is that an answer to Angela's question? So can Possibly, someone from yeah. reading your book learn when it's important to slow down? Uh, it's not something that will happen to a reader who is not prepared for it. You know, it's not something that will happen as a result of reading the book, I don't think. You know, that somebody will, will draw the conclusion that uh, you, you want to... I've you know, always been a little bit more optimistic than you. Yeah, yeah so. about, about <laughs> everything. Uh, what about a different book, rather than, so I read your book is... <laughs> <laughs> Nudges. Nudges, I thought, was a more positive book. And, even that book is really organized to communicate to people who control organizations. I, I'm thinking Angela is thinking more about, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Please put words I mean, in my mouth. Imagine that someone wrote a book that was designed to teach the skills of self-management to the typical 20-year-old in a college. So written for that audience, not about the academic literature, not about the history of ideas, not about generalization, but really a practical guide to self-management um, directed at young people, or even not so young people, but written with that I purpose. Would, I would, yeah, I mean, I, it, that certainly is worth trying. I mean, it's not, uh, and, you know, it's, you know, there, there are so many books that are trying to teach, you know, there's so much demand for those books, and by and large, you know, they accomplish so little that it would have to be somebody would have to have an idea that is different, you know, from those shells that you that you find in airports and in other places that are full of books that will you read this book, it will change you forever. <laughs> so uh, there are too many books that promise to change you forever. So I think with that, I'm going to thank Danny for taking the time to visit with us, but also thank, thank you for the research that you started doing a long time ago that's really had a dramatic effect on so many of our lives. So thank you for all you've done for us.